very good morning to each and every one of you and warm welcome to the second Sunday in Advent. We are gathered in God's presence to worship Him and to magnify His wonderful name. May I invite all of us to respond to the call to worship. Lift up your voice, lift it up, do not fear. Feeding, gathering, carrying, leading, this is how God will come. The old will pass away, a new world will dawn. Love, faithfulness, righteousness, peace, this will mark God's new day. Love needs a path, peace needs a highway. Even as we wait, let us make a way for God in our hearts and in our world. Let us worship God. Let's continue to worship our living God by singing this introit hymn, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. Shall we say the opening prayer together? God, we are confident you are coming, bringing a world where all will be made right. Calm our anxiety, strengthen our patience, and keep our hope aflame as we work towards and wait for your new day. Amen. What a joy it is to worship our Lord. Come, let's put our voices together in singing the opening hymn, It Came Upon the Midnight Clear, a wonderful Christmas hymn. Thank you. 
responsive reading, the Psalter for this morning is Psalm 85, verses 1 and 2, and verses 8 to 13. Psalm 85, verse 1. The Lord showed favor to your land. You restored the fortunes of Jacob. You forgave the iniquity of your people. You pardoned all their sin. Let me hear what God will speak, for the Lord will speak peace to his people, to his faithful, to those who turn to the Lord in their hearts. Surely salvation is at hand for those who fear him, that glory may dwell in our land. Steadfast love and faithfulness will meet. Righteousness and peace will kiss each other. Faithfulness springs up from the ground and righteousness looks down from the sky. The Lord will give what is good and our land will yield its increase. Righteousness will go before the Lord and make God's footsteps away. Shall we go to God in prayer? Oh, God is a prayer answering God, even as we are here in God's presence. May we quiet in our hearts and surrender ourselves afresh at the feet of the living God. Come, let's pray. Almighty God, our Creator and our Redeemer, we praise your glory. We rejoice in your loving kindness. We celebrate your goodness and your grace in our lives. Father, surely you are our salvation. And apart from you, there is no hope in this life or the next. We cling on to you. We cling on to your promises. For you are from everlasting to everlasting and your promises, they bind us together, and your promises enrich our hearts. Father, moments like this are very precious to us, moments of surrender, moments of beholding the one who loves us with that everlasting love. Lord, many a time, having tasted your love, yet, Lord, we have walked away from your precepts. We have not kept your ways to your truth. Father, this morning we ask of you to forgive us our hearts afresh. Lord, cleanse our hearts, Lord. Restore the joy that comes from you. And Father, fill us with your spirit. And Lord, may your joy be abundant in our lives. And fill us, Lord, to the overflowing capacity. Father, even as we have gathered here this morning, in this season of Advent, we want to thank you for your gift to this world, the gift of your Son and our Savior, Lord Jesus Christ. Father, during the season of Christmas, help us, Lord, to be your faithful witnesses because you have given us that beautiful and glorious message of hope, of peace, and love to this world that is longing for love, that is longing for peace, and that is longing for the real hope that is found in Christ, in Christ alone. Gracious God, we, this morning, Lord, seek your grace, seek your strength, so that we might walk with you in a closer way and be your witnesses and your, your instruments to reflect the love of Christ to the loveless world. 
Gracious God, in this season filled with songs of love and joy, Lord, help us, Lord, to always remember of your love for us and that you're always there to forgive us when we come to you with repentant heart and with faith. Gracious God, we pray, Lord, that you would bless our faith community in a very special way. And all those who are gathered here to worship you, Father, we pray that you would touch each and every individual in a very special way. Lord, in their own facets, in their own areas of life, Lord, may your mighty hand come upon them. Lord, may you stretch forth your loving arm to bless them. Lord, to transform every single individual, little by little, into the image of your Son and our Savior, Lord Jesus Christ. Gracious God, even as we come to you, speak to us, Lord. Continue to work in our hearts, Lord. Continue to fill our lives with your word, Lord, that we might demonstrate the knowledge of Lord Jesus Christ and the love and his attributes day by day as we continue to live for Christ. Lord, if there is someone struggling in their own areas of life, Father, we pray, Lord, that you would be so close to them. May your comfort and may your peace surround them and fill them in a very special way. Father, in their various moments of confusion, may there be your clarity. Lord, in their moments of disappointments, may you be close to them to grant them that needed encouragement and needed joy. Father, if there's someone longing for your healing touch to be upon them, may your healing come upon them. Lord, in every sense of the word, Lord, may you be with your children. And Lord, take them out of the predicament. And Lord, help them to walk with you and to glorify your name. Lord, we want to thank you for the vision and mission of the church. Lord, in seasons like this, help us, Lord, to look out for avenues to touch lives and to bring hope and healing of Lord Jesus Christ into the communities. Lord, we want to thank you for the 12th session of the General Conference of the Methodist Church in Singapore. Father, we want to thank you for the fruitful conferencing. We want to thank you, Lord, for the bishop, new bishop, Dr. Gordon Wong, continue to bless him, his family, and his ministry. Father, may we continue to be faithful unto you, and may we all walk with you to glorify your wonderful name. We once again thank you for all your goodness and your grace. And even as we prepare ourselves for the word that comes to us through your servant, Lord, help us, Lord, to be recipients of your word and help us, Lord, to be obedient to it so that we might bring glory and honor to your name. We thank you, and we just want to come in each and every one of us into your humble and mighty hands and ask all these things in the most precious and wonderful name. Lord and Savior Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. Shall we sing the Lord's Prayer in the tune of Wesley Tullus?
come, let's celebrate God's provision in our lives. And even as we bring our tithes and offerings into God's presence, shall we sing this offer to him, once in royal David's city. The scripture passage for this morning's meditation is taken from Mark's Gospel, chapter 1, verses 21 to 28. Mark's Gospel, chapter 1, verses 21 to 28. They went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, Jesus went into the synagogue and began to teach. The people were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as one who had authority, not as the teachers of the law. Just then a man in their synagogue who was possessed by an impure spirit cried out, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet, said Jesus sternly. Come out of him. The impure spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek. The people were all so amazed that they asked each other, What is this? A new teaching, and with authority, he even gives orders to impure spirits, and they obey him. News about him spread quickly over the whole region of Galilee. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The word of the Lord will be brought to us by Reverend Dr. Babu Emanuel. Greetings, everyone, in the name of Jesus, our Lord. And it's always a great joy to meet together in this fashion to listen to God's Word. And particularly, it's my great joy and privilege to share with you God's Word today. I hope you're all well, and please continue to take uh, good care of yourself and everyone around you. Today, the topic for our meditation is 
demonstration of Jesus' power based on the text that was read to us, Mark chapter 1, verses 21 to 28. Demonstration of Jesus' power. As you have heard, the passage has to do with a particular story of Jesus casting out an evil spirit, an impure spirit, or a demon, however you call. We'll use these words quite interchangeably. <clears throat> but today, I'm not going to talk about any uh, phenomenon that is normally interpreted or normally seen as some kind of demon possession. I don't think I'm in any, uh, I, I don't think I have, possi I, I possess any uh, great abilities or expertise uh, in any sense of the term to explain to you what it is and therefore I would safely stay away from explaining the phenomenon that is normally uh, interpreted, normally taken as demon possession. <coughs> Demon possession seems to be a religious term uh, because in medical world, for instance, uh, medical science or even psychology, uh, psychiatry, uh, they would use perhaps terms like psychosomatic conditions. Uh, but even that, perhaps I'm not in any position to explain what it is all about. And therefore, I will not explain anything to do with demon possession. But going by the text that was read to us, I would highlight to you few uh, ideas that have caught my attention. Normally, in any sermon, you have three-point sermon, actually. That's a good way of making things uh, easy for anyone to remember. But today, I would like to look at it from a different point of view. Uh, looking at the issue from the point of view of various characters, if you want to uh, take that word, uh, characters, uh, in the story, so that the story gets some new meaning. If you look at verse 23, very briefly, if you look at verse 23, you have the case that in the synagogue there was a demon-possessed man. That is the, that is the issue, that's the problem, that's the case. And how is it seen? How is it handled? The problem is there, but how is the problem approached? How is the problem handled? That is the, that's, that's the uh, point that I want to uh, discuss with you today. First of all, look at the demon-possessed man. <clears throat> the demon-possessed man is in the synagogue, Perhaps he wasn't even aware that he was demon-possessed or that he had an evil spirit. So you could call him some kind of a victim who wasn't even aware that he was the victim. And uh, the, the evil spirit, going by the various other accounts, the evil spirit could have tormented him, could have controlled or dominated his behavior, his social behavior, his personal life and his mental life in, in every possible way. But he may not have been able to associate these, these abnormal behavior to uh, or with any, any evil spirit. So in this case, uh, Jesus appears and uh, he exorcises in the sense he casts out uh, the, the evil spirit. The, the point is, that this man is simply the victim, and Jesus, he, he, when Jesus enters, he even says, you are the Holy One of God. Okay, now come to think of it. He had some kind of an idea, however he got it, but here in the story, it is associated with the evil spirit. But this is not a wrong theology, that Jesus is the Holy One of God was already announced by the angel. So Jesus is the Holy One of God. However, the demon-possessed man came to know about it. But that knowledge alone, that information that Jesus is the, is the Holy One of God, didn't make any difference to his life. And of course, as the story goes, Jesus casts out the demon, but even that healing didn't make any big difference to this man's life. At least, we don't read that in the story. So first, you have the case of the victim. 
He was simply there, he got a benefit, and he didn't, it didn't really make any big difference. Secondly, you look at the setting of the story. The setting of the story is, it is the, it's the Sabbath, and it is, it's a story that happens in the synagogue. Okay, <clears throat> Sabbath and synagogue, these are two powerful symbols of Jew Jewish religion as an institutionalized religion, powerful symbols. So it were you, if, when you're thinking of a spatial setting, it was the synagogue. Synagogue meaning a worship place like this, a church, a place where everyone came together to worship. But for the Jews, it was a sacred place. And you think of the temporal setting. The temporal setting was that it was on the Sabbath. And according to the, the, the Ten Commandments, Jews were expected to observe Sabbath as a holy day. So they could not think of even violating. But what is important for me is that, and, and also for instance, in every synagogue you had a synagogue leader. So this particular episode happens in the synagogue. But for the, for the institutionalized religion, and also for the different symbols we have, it didn't really matter who ever had come there to worship. So there was a sense of apathy, you may say. It didn't really matter. Nobody knew that there was among them a demon-possessed man. And as I said, in every synagogue you had, for instance, a synagogue leader. A synagogue leader didn't even bother to know who had come in, what was their life like, what was the challenges. It didn't really matter. But what would have been very critical for the, for the organized religion or the institutionalized religion is not that you do well personally, but that you keep to the institution of religion, that you, you, that you don't violate the dictates of the religion. So religion is important, but what happens to you as an individual doesn't really matter. So this is the second approach to the issue, the issue of demon position. That is very, very specific to the passage that we are looking at. So even if we are talking about demonstration of Jesus' power, it is terribly restricted to or limited to the story that we are reading it, we are not going to come up with any big conclusions about life and various settings. Thirdly, you have Jesus as the main, main character of the story. So if you look at verse 21, it says that Jesus entered the synagogue. Perhaps he wasn't even aware that there was going to be a demon-possessed man and there was going to be some kind of encounter. <clears throat> okay, see, he enters and he casts out the demon. So what can we say? We are looking at the demonstration of Jesus' power. First of all, we could think about the power of a healing presence. In the eyes of the synagogue leader, and perhaps even in the eyes of the other worshippers, other Jews, and perhaps even in the eyes of the demon-possessed man as Jesus entered, he would have appeared simply as, as any other ordinary Jew. But here comes a man into a critical situation and he makes a difference. His presence is a healing presence. And you also read in the same passage that Jesus preached authoritatively. So the power of, the power of a powerful teaching, you could say, authoritative teaching. We don't know the content of it, but the, the casting out of the demon is in demonstration of Jesus' powerful preaching. Jesus never embarked on uh, a free healing crusade or exorcising crusade. It happened always in the Gospels, in the context of his teaching. But what is also important is that he, he commands the impure spirit to come out, of the, uh, come out of the man. So you could think of the power of the spoken language, the spoken word. Spoken word creates life, actually. It has to create life. It heals. It confronts. So the power of spoken language. Whether Jesus really intended to make a demonstration of all these things, I don't think. It was so spontaneous, so natural. So uh, the power of 
the healing presence of a person, the power of spoken word. But I also think in the story, as I have already talked about the synagogue, there is also a power struggle. At one level, Jesus is able to cast out the demon, but I think that would have been much easier than casting out the demon called a mindset in the synagogue. Okay, as I said, in, the Jew in Jewish religion, Sabbath was a powerful symbol. You cannot violate that according to the Ten Commandments. <clears throat> and if you violate the Sabbath, it would even be, uh, even be uh, equivalent to a blasphemy. Perhaps that will be punishable by the law. So, going by the other accounts of what happens on the Sabbath, when Jesus heals somebody, the religious leaders are actually annoyed. And that sets on motion what is technically called the Sabbath controversy. So, at one level, there is, there is, there is healing. But another level, there is power struggle where Jesus is not able to really do his or demonstrate his power because healing a demon-possessed man, I would think, is much easier than exorcising people of, uh, of another demon called their mindset. It's a power struggle, and that's, that's, a, that's something that we must take note of. Then in the case of Jesus, we also notice a powerful attitude. The case is there, a demon-possessed man. So one man approaches the victim uh, with, with approaches the whole thing with some kind of a victim mindset. The institutionalized mind doesn't really bother. It's so indifferent, apathetic, you could say. Whereas Jesus looks at the whole case completely differently. It's all in your mind, how you approach your case, how you approach the problem. Fourthly, you also have a crowd in the story, the people, the congregation. They were so impressed. They were so, so impressed. In fact, the word says that they were amazed. So it was only a response of surprise. It was a response of amazement, wonder and amazement. Okay, so they have heard the powerful word from Jesus because he teaches and they acknowledged that Jesus was an authoritative teacher. And Jesus also powerfully speaks and casts out the demon. But what kind of an impact would it have had or should it have had on the congregation? We really do not know. Of course, they do go out and publicize the whole story, but it didn't make any big difference. They were simply amazed. So it is possible for them that they were there simply with a sense of curiosity. Or perhaps they thought it was a good show of some kind of a powerful entertainment. So they went around and publicized the news. Whereas we have no evidence in the story that it made any big difference. Finally, what is the, we are looking at the idea of the demonstration of Jesus' power. What can we conclude? What would it mean for our lives? I'm not going to say that we will pray that God will give us the gift to, to cast our demons Perhaps that is possible. That is looking at the story as it is, and then we can make certain conclusions. But in my mind, what seems to be more important for me is to acknowledge that all of us have our own demons. Each one of us has our own demons. Not demons in the way we, we display or exhibit certain kind of behavior that is, that is normally uh, translated or interpreted as demon possession. But we have various other demons. Ego is a demon. Very difficult to cast out. We have our own fears. Fears of different kinds. I have a big dictionary called Dictionary of Phobias and Fears. We, for instance, are afraid of our future. We are afraid of death. We are afraid of our health. We are afraid of economy. We are afraid of job, retrenchment. Then we have guilt. These are all demons, guilt. We can think of shame. We can think of 
uh, some kind of a traumatic experience that we have had in the past. The past itself can be haunting us as a kind of demon. And uh, a kind of mindset, we could think of it. And in our world today, there is another demon we have to think about, and that is a demon called becoming irrelevant for society, for economy, for life itself, different kinds of demons. But what the role of Jesus in the story displays is that the problem is there, but how do we approach it? So Jesus' story becomes a powerful model for us to emulate him, that there are issues, there are problems, but we don't have to be merely victims, but we can. We can approach the issue with the mindset of a victor. We have the inherent, ingrained, or in, in, innate potential, the ability that God himself has given us, I would think. Many a time, the issue may not change. There are issues, there are problems that will not simply change. But sometimes, the issues and the problems can change us, change our thinking, change our mind. In, in our normal, common language, we say the survival of the fittest. We can think of the fittest as someone physically, physically fit, but that's not the case. Scientifically, they say, the fittest person is the one who is able to adapt, who is able to change. So in this case, if we are able to change our thinking from victim mindset to a victor's mindset, I think that will be perfectly following the wonderful demonstration of power, a powerful way of approaching issues, powerful way of thinking by Jesus himself. May we continue to think about all these things and take this idea to different life settings, wherever you happen as a person, wherever you live as a person, wherever you work as a person, and I'm sure life is going to be a lot, lot different. God bless us. We thank God for the word that has come to us. and We thank our dear pastor, Reverend Dr. Babu Emmanuel. May we continue to be obedient to God's word and Let's continue to follow him. Come in closing, let's sing this beautiful hymn. There's a song in the air. Very good morning to each and every one of you. Indeed, it's a joy and a privilege to be here in God's presence and to participate in this worship service. Let's take a look at the church news. Let's thank God for His grace on this dear uh, 
brother, Mr. Morgan Chandran, who's celebrating his birthday. May God's blessings be upon him. And also this dear friends who are celebrating their blessed anniversary, may God's abundant blessings be upon his children. This is an announcement regarding the tithes and offerings. Let's continue to give unto the Lord with a generous heart, and we could do so in the form of a check or internet banking or through pay now facility. The details are captured on the screen. You can follow the details accordingly. Good morning, church. Just before benediction, one last announcement. Weeks ago, we had our 45th e-tech session, and we had some changes across the board. I would like to just read out the new pastoral appointments for the year 2021. Our dear pastor in charge, Reverend James Nagelin, is appointed to Sleta Tamil Methodist Church, SPIC. Pastoral Assistant Reverend Jeremy James is appointed to Jurong Tamil Methodist Church. And Reverend Vijay Joseph is appointed as pastor in charge for Tamil Methodist Church Short Street. Reverend Anil Kumar Samuel continues as Associate Minister for Tamil Methodist Church. Please keep them in your prayers. Thank you. Come, shall we all arise with the memory verse for the month of December? Come, let's recite the memory verse together. I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. Luke's Gospel, chapter 15, verse 7. Come, let's receive the benediction. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit rest and abide with us all, now and forevermore. Amen. Please be seated and have a wonderful week ahead. God bless you.